On this episode of Talking Cardboard, we bring the original gang back together and we're giving you holiday gift ideas 2023. And on this episode, we're giving you our holiday buying guide for board games 2023. All right, Corey, we've got a bunch of games that we're gonna be talking about on this episode. What were the criteria we are using for giving ideas to the, the viewers? Yeah, we've got a lot of games going on today. Four different categories. We've got stocking stuffer, cooperative, beginner games, and expert games. Or nice. kind of more for the gamer uh, in your family. Looking forward to trying to find games for a wide array of people. So let's start it off, John. What is your stocking stuffer game that you'd suggest for 2023? So my stocking stuffer category is a little broad, but I'm gonna narrow it down slightly as we get into it. But overall, for me specifically, and people that enjoy like card games, whether they be collectible, customizable, trading card games, like anything like Pokemon, Magic, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, those are all great. However, if you're looking for something that's on sale and should be through the holidays, uh, I'm probably stealing Jersh Sunder here, but 20% off on all Stoneblade products. So Soulforge Fusion would be a great game to stuff in those stockings. That's a good call. <laughs> I will riff off of that. It was not my choice. <laughs> ah. well, thank you for trying to steal yeah, my thunder. Tried to get them. <laughs> but Soulforge Fusion, we did a review video for that. It is a two player kind of head to head game. And if you are buying a starter set that is everything that two people need to get into the game, they recently did a Kickstarter for the digital client and their third set, The Last Winter, and that's going to be upcoming launching this spring. So I think that is a great idea. And yeah, they are doing a 20% uh, a off. My stocking stuff, we're also in kind of the card game realm, is what could be this year's Tickle Me Elmo doll. If you remember that old reference of kind of the holiday gift that would be really difficult to find. But Disney Lorcana. Yeah. Uh, yep. And I think that that is, you can buy a booster pack for, you know, five, ten dollars. It depends on where you're looking. It's great for all ages, for kids that just like the Disney intellectual property. It's great for people that want to try to kind of get into card games, but aren't really into magic or intimidated by these games that have a really competitive scene. Yeah. And I encourage people that if you are buying some of these decks, or packs to learn how to play the game. It's yeah. a very simple game. It's easy to get into the community, super friendly because it's based out of like Disney and people trying alternatives to the big competitive games. Mm -hmm. So if you can get your hands on some packs of Lorcana, I think that is an excellent stocking stuffer. Or even the starter decks. The starter decks yes. are still fun to yeah. play with. Yes, they're well constructed. They're very balanced with each other. And now between the first two sets, there are five different options for you where you can crack one of those open, take it to a table and play a little bit. And with Lorcana is it doesn't have to be a head to head. You can have multiple people and kind of do a, a commander style game where yeah. it's great for casual gaming. And heck, if you are going to a family gathering and you could take out three, four or five different decks and have just people kind of learn to play together. Right, and yeah. people more familiarized with Disney. Yeah. So it might be something you can actually convince people to play over Magic and Pokemon might be a little tougher. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not a slapped on theme either. I think the cards yeah. really play well to the theme in yeah. that game. And yeah, it's a great theme that everybody can get into. Yeah, Corey, what's your stocking stuffer? Mine is a little, tiny little game that'll fit easily in a stocking called No Thanks. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I don't remember if I picked this game or not uh, for the stocking stuffer for last year, but it's just a, it's a great one that, again, you can bring to family gatherings for the mm -hmm. holidays. Everybody can get into. Very easy rule set. You can learn the game within two minutes at the most, mm -hmm. um, but pretty much you're flipping over a card and you are saying whether or not, no thanks, I don't want the card by putting a chip into the middle or taking the card. And the whole goal of the game is to have the least uh, total value in front of you at the end of the round. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult too, because you do have to, if you run out of chips, you can't say no thanks without a chip to put into the center. So it's, sometimes you're forced into taking those higher cards that you don't want. Uh, each chip that you gather or that you keep safe next to you is worth negative one point at the end as well. So it's that tough balance between do I take the card or not, or do I pass it on to the next person? And it's really as simple as that. It's a simple game. It takes, what, 15 minutes to play? Yep. 
and if you wanted to keep score at the end and do multiple rounds, go for it. But the game itself is just you play, you count up who has the fewest amount of points. Great, you win. Let's shuffle up and do it again. You say no thanks a lot. That's all you got to do. Yeah. yeah. It's a really simple, fun game. And I know we like playing it. I played it a whole bunch over Thanksgiving with family. And you introduce it to new people. And it's a great casual entry level game. And it's super, super cost effective as well. Yeah, that's true too. And I forget the player count, the exact player count, but I think it plays up to a large number of players too. I think it, it's up too. to six, five or six, five I think. Or, okay, which is which is a good amount. Yeah. Definitely for family gatherings, you want that higher player count. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of family gatherings, and when you're bringing people together, a lot of times you want to be doing things communally or cooperatively. So let's talk about our cooperative games. John, what is the cooperative game you suggest people buy this year? So this is a favorite genre I've liked for a while now, and this will kind of be beating a dead horse, but a new version of this game just came out recently. You can also get this for a discounted price at uh, big box stores, uh, specifically Target for sure. But that is Horrified Greek Monsters. Uh, I actually didn't even know this was out until about a week ago. I was just perusing through the kids section with my son, saw this on the shelf, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> Horrified itself has had this will be the third version, I believe. They've had the American Mon or the Universal Monsters, mm -hmm. and then uh, someone help me out. What's they the did other? an American? Yeah, the American Monsters. monsters yep. yep. And now they're on Greek monsters, so they're trying to kind of rehash what they've done. But it's a very good cooperative game uh, where you each take on the role of a specific character, and you're basically going through actions on your turn and trying to defeat uh, the monsters that are present in your game. Multiple iconic monsters. So yes. you've got like. Uh, the Wolfman, you've got Dracula. Yep. Do you remember any of the I don't ones? even know okay. it's in the Greek one, but I can only assume like Medusa, the Minotaur, yeah. stuff like that. I took a quick peek at the box, but it all eludes my memory now. So, yeah. you know, good timing. And, and that's a really good game where it's a little bit harder to quarterback yes. or to have one person that's in charge and telling everybody what to do because mm -hmm. you're fighting multiple monsters. So you're all trying to act together and maybe you could have somebody that's saying, all right, you three go for this monster, I'm gonna do this and we need a couple of people to maybe mitigate these things here. But it's really difficult for one person to just kind of take charge, which I know in some other kind of cooperative games, somebody just kind of falls into that yep. role or multiple mm -hmm. people and then it's less fun. Right. But a game like Horrified, there's always so much going on. It's not too difficult. There are some of the monsters that are more challenging to defeat which is good, but... Yeah, yeah. And, and I like it too because ultimately my mindset is people do whatever they want because there's some games where you just might get unlucky and mm -hmm. things don't go your way anyway, so you might as well just try to let people be creative and see what happens and, you know, yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah, super fun. Corey, what is your cooperative game to suggest for our people this year? Well, John's was definitely a good one. I'm going to spin it another way. If it were for me personally, it would probably be more of something like Spirit Island, but that's yeah. just too too heavy for me to recommend for the holidays. So I'm going to go with Paleo. Ooh, okay. Paleo, yep. kind of a sleeper hit. Uh, it had a lot of buzz a couple years ago and uh, not really talked about as much anymore, but it's still widely available and a very another very easy game to play and introduce to people. I've introduced it to my family and my dad, who doesn't play a whole lot of board games, and he understood it pretty quickly as well. But it, it's very simple. You have a deck of cards with some threats and some good things all mixed in. Uh, the backs of the cards have different locations, like, you know, like forest locations or rivers or mountains, and pretty much you shuffle it all up and deal it equally out to each player and they're simply uh, playing a card face down at which location they wish to visit and try to tackle whatever is on the other side of that card. Like I said, it could be something really difficult, it could be something a little bit easier, but what I really enjoy in this cooperative game, uh, again, less quarterbacking because there is a lot of uh, having to help your teammates out yeah. a lot mm -hmm. in this game because there are a lot of those cards that you cannot tackle alone. No matter how hard you try, you need the helping hand from another player. So I really appreciate that in this game. You are, yeah, Paleo, Paleo Americans. You're out there, you're trying to survive, you're trying to gather supplies and defeat whatever, you know, wolves and other things that might come your way. And it's, it's a lot of fun and plays quickly as well. Just in the base box alone, another thing I appreciate is that there are so many different modules that you can throw yes. in the mix too. Yes, modules are, are a good, nice, yeah. tight element to games like that. Yeah, so that plays into a lot of variety in the replayability, which I appreciate. And didn't you run a game of that at uh, Con of the North 2023? Yep, yeah, last year Con of the North went over really well. All brand new people have never played the game before, and like I said, sat down, everybody learned it. Uh, you know, it take, took a couple people a little bit longer to learn, but even then, it was five, 10 minutes, we were all up and running. And cooperative, a great thing with cooperative games, you're helping one another out. So even if you don't fully understand it to begin with, you really, um, 
you can really start to understand it after a little while just with that helping hand from your from your teammates. Yeah, so. and it's always good if you are unfamiliar with games or this game in particular, it, the fact you're all in it together. Yep. Yeah. That's a great element of cooperative games. I took this category in a slightly different direction and I went with a legacy game because even if it's not technically cooperative all working together, is you're all sitting down for things uh, where you're building the game together, yeah. multiple sessions. And the new one that's out this year is Ticket to Ride Legacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it, it's a it's a big box. I haven't been able to open it yet. I, I have purchased it, but uh, if you're familiar with the game Ticket to Ride, is it is a rail system of the United States of America, and you are going from different cities to each other, trying to make these railways, and then you're getting points based on the distance of the cities. Now with Legacy games, they always start out with a stripped down basic version of the game and then you're building out the more iterations you play. Yep. So with a game like Ticket to Ride, you can imagine that there are new cities that are being added. Maybe you're changing the color of the railways. Uh, I was gonna say, I'm super interested to see what spin they put on it for a legacy game. I can only imagine like some of the options you mentioned or maybe people end up owning certain railways mm -hmm. permanently. I don't know, but very, very intrigued by this game. Highly recommend someone checking this out. Yeah. Because uh, I've heard rave reviews, and uh, yeah, it's a nice, simple game to get into, especially if you're not like a hardcore gamer, so. Yeah, and a legacy version, then it encourages the same groups of people to be coming back and playing again and again. So in that respect, there's that cooperation of, you know, let's, we're here for all of Christmas Day, let's spend three hours and play through three or four sessions of this. And an interesting part about this legacy game is it plays down to two players. So if it's all, if it's difficult for you to get four, five, or six players to the table consistently, it's hard to get all these schedules together. This is a legacy game that you can play at two players. So that might be intriguing for a couple or, or people who are roommates that just you don't get a whole lot of other people that you can coordinate with. You can play this legacy at two people. 100%. Yeah. And yep. another fantastic thing with newer legacy games is that it's replayable after you're finished. Yes. Which, you know, the older legacy games, you couldn't do that. Once you were done, once it was done, it was done. Uh, so this one, once the board is built and everything is built out, the new rules are implemented, it's a full-on game you can play forever. Yeah. Which is neat. It's really cool. And I know I have heard rumblings of them adding different mechanisms and different things in this game, too. I don't know if they add, like, a like a stock market element or if they add, I think they add, like, delivering passengers to different locations. Ooh. And just enough of those extra layers, I think this will refresh that for the Ticket to Ride series for you. Yeah. So we've been talking cooperative games, and a lot of that has been based on barrier of entry, where if you're new to games, this is something to be comfortable with. What's another suggestion for new gamers that you would have uh, on the table for this holiday season, John? I think I'm just looking back to like games I started with that really intrigued me and got me into the hobby. And one of those games is a game we've played at the base set, we've played the legacy version, and that's Betrayal at House on the Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, very good semi-cooperative game you all start out as a team exploring this haunted house mm -hmm. events trigger as you explore the house and eventually one people becomes the traitor and come they get given a new rule set for how to finish the game out so the traitor will have one end game objective and then the rest of the players will have an objective to essentially defeat that traitor a uh, very interesting game it's always a spin every time you play. There's tons of different scenarios on how things play out depending uh, what the different um, curses are that come out. Mm -hmm. um, very, very good game. Uh, probably better, you know, for people that like cooperative or uh, exploration type uh, themes. But very solid game, easy to play. Uh, good time. A couple additions on that is they came out with a third edition with brighter cards, redone yep. artwork and they tightened up a few of the things that uh, Betrayal House on the Hill is a very expansive yes. game and yeah. with each new edition they tighten up things that kind of make it a little bit difficult but when you know there's so many moving parts that are going on behind the scenes that the player experience sometimes kind of falls apart a little bit this third edition tightens a lot of those up and they have a, uh, a little expansion that is holiday themed Yes. Yep. Yeah, so test that out. That works only with third edition. I don't know if it's based on artwork or game mechanics specifically, but you won't be able to play this with like Betrayal Legacy or first or second edition. So just be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Corey, what was your beginner game for this holiday season? 
My Beginner Game is actually a fun one. It's by designers Kramer and Kiesling, and they're usually known for more of the heavier Euro designs, but mm -hmm. they came out with a game just this past year, brand new, hitting store shelves here that is on the lighter side of things, and it's called Wandering Towers. And it's a game that, another game, definitely friendly for beginners, but also for family fun as well, where you've got these castle towers that are in this circular shape, almost like a rondelle board, and you're sending your little meeples around the board trying to get them to the last tower on the end of the circle there. But what's unique with that is that you are, it's card play. You've got cards in your hand, and the card that you play down dictates the action you can do with your wizards. Some of them are spells, and they're really manipulating the towers and able to lift them up and move them, and some of them are kind of catapulting your people forward faster than some of the other people but what's unique with that is if you land on top of a tower and somebody uses let's say a spell to, to shift a tower on top of your meeple now they're stuck within that tower until it can be lifted off mm -hmm. and it's definitely got that layer element to it to where if you're stuck let's say in the second layer of the tower and since then five more layers have been added on with more and more towers and it's taller and taller taller and taller of a tower, then uh, <laughs> spells usually can only manipulate one tower at a time. So then they're stuck there for multiple turns and can really slow you down. So it's just kind of a spatial thing, spatial awareness, trying to get your meeples around the board without getting captured. Uh, another thing too is you're trying to fill potions, that's the other win condition. And to fill a potion, it simply is just putting a tower on top of somebody else's meeple. Mm -hmm. So very simple rules. Another game where you've got uh, a multiple plethora of different spells you can add into the mix once you get familiar with the game, but you can just start off with the basic cards to begin with, mm -hmm. and, and you can just get rocking and rolling within five minutes. So. It's a, it's a fun one. I've played it a few times now. And that does sound like it's very dynamic and interactive too, which is always great for new games is you want things that people can get their hands on yeah. and start to learn kind of tactilely, really yeah. get invested. Yeah, and it can make for some laughable moments too. Kind of a memory game, like where, where was my last guy again? I don't remember which <laughs> tower he's stuck in and it's kind of fun uh, to, to play with that, so. My board game for beginners is Disney Dixit. Hmm. That came out just a couple of months ago. It's new in 2023. If you've played the original Dixit, then this is a Disney re-theming of it. And I think that that is a really important part of this game. In Dixit, everybody is given these artistic kind of almost painting type cards. And you take turns being the, the dealer and that person is going to pick out one of their cards and give a one word clue where other people are gonna to try to pick out their cards from the options that everybody gives. Think kind of a, an artistic like apples to apples or cards against humanity, sure, yeah. that type of thing. But the, the dealer, the person who's giving the one word clue wants some people to get their card, but not everybody. Mm -hmm, yeah. So it's kind of a balancing act where you need to know your audience, where you're trying to play to some people, but not everybody, because then you as a dealer wouldn't get any points. The Disney part of this is all of these art cards are Disney themed. So you've got cool. Disney characters on them which I think really incorporates a lot of people who aren't very creative. Mm -hmm. That if you struggle with trying to come up with a, a really perfect word to get some people to guess your card, but not everybody, or you don't like being quick on your feet with ideas and things, mm -hmm. if you know the Disney movie, which so many people have seen so many Disney movies, then you could just do a, try to describe part of that movie. Yeah where then you know some people would get it, some people might not. The artwork is all great. Yep. You've got Disney little meeples, just different Disney characters for me scoring your points. Yep. It's a really fun, light game. And because it's Disney themed, I think it makes it really approachable for a lot of beginning gamers. Yeah. And the players who are not the dealer, who are playing the cards, they get points for people guessing their card as well. So you're yep. really trying to get it close to that keyword. I haven't played the Disney version yet. I think it would almost make it more difficult if I'm imagining this correctly because you are giving a clue that might be so obvious to to what movie it's from or what character it's from that it might be hard to kind of throw people off or get that that tough balance but the cards in this game are so abstracted anyway mm -hmm. to begin with and like i said i haven't seen the disney ones yet but that's that also makes it um you know adds adds complexity but also that element that you need to have some people not guess correctly as well i think the the disney character as part of it is more of kind of a life raft to people that don't want to describe it more abstractly because yeah. it, it's it's not just a uh cut out scene from the movie is you've got disney characters that are doing weird things like uh, i don't know if it's toy story where they're uh, going across a clothesline. I don't think that happened in any of the movies, but then you could reference Toy Story or, you know, High Wire or something. Yeah. So it's just, it's another option for people 
that, you know, it, it could add more complexity to it, but I think the Disney side of it is a lifeline to uh, a wider range of people. For sure. And now to finish up on the opposite end of the spectrum, we're going for our suggestion for the game for gamer gamers. <laughs> game gamer The game gamers. for gamer gamers. Yes. <laughs> gamer gamer games. We're looking at the intense games. Don't cut that. We're looking at the intense games for people who have a wide library such as this, where you've played a lot of games, but you want to be scratching a very particular itch. John, let's start with you. Yeah, I was trying to think of something that came out this year that I know I would enjoy and that kind of settled on the war game-esque category. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't a super deep game, but I think it's not going to appeal necessarily to a new gamer, and that's going to be Undaunted Great Britain. A uh, new version of Undaunted that came out if anyone's played Normandy or uh, Stalingrad or anything. Uh, the Great Britain version is different and expands upon the game because now you're going to the war in the skies. Yep. So you're getting fighter jets and bombers and going through the campaign that way, uh, which if you haven't played Undaunted before, it has a campaign scenario structure mm -hmm. where you can actually walk through the scenarios one by one, or you can just pick it up and play a random scenario with someone and go at it. But I really like the World War II theme. There's some deck building, uh, there's some area control and objectives on uh, procedurally generated tile maps. Uh, really, really top game for me, and this one just came out, so really curious to give it a try, and I think other people should check it out too. I have noticed you bring the original one to the table a bunch of times, like when I'm on my way over and somebody else is here. It's pretty quick to get set up yep. mm -hmm. and dive people into it. So I think that that's good for gamer gamers, game gamers. Gamer gamers. Gamer gamers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that's a really good suggestion. And, now, and they do have a futuristic one coming out next year, I believe, ooh, too. I completely like, forgot about that. Like, yeah. What was, I don't even remember what it was Set called. in the 2200. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay, Sci-fi, yeah. Okay, good. Still give us a little bit of time before we hit that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> See us next year or two years from now. Yeah. <laughs> Not like iRobot set in the year 2035. Yeah. Oh, it's coming geez. up 11 years. 11 years. And it could actually be true to the movie in 11 years, uh, I think. Uh, anyway. I'm going to do my game suggestion for Deep Gamers because, John, it's based off of one of our favorite games of all time, Dune Imperium. Mm -hmm. They have a new expansion that is just out, Dune Imperium Uprising. Yep. Check out all of our videos that we have reviewing Dune Imperium, a lot of playthroughs of it because that's a game that we all, as Talking Cardboard, have really enjoyed a lot of. Strategy deep dive video too. Yes, yes. We've done a, a lot of deep because it is a, a deck builder, but it's also worker placement. It is resource management. There's combat. Area control. Area yeah. control. It's so deep. And now that they've got a third expansion to it, where it adds for a sixth player and a th possible 3v3 hmm. game. Hmm. So it, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but... I, we both love Dune Imperium. Oh, yeah. I know it's also on your, your top list five, somewhere. Top five for sure. Yep. So if you are really deep into games and you've played Dune Imperium, this might be something to check out to really dive into a new fresh way to be playing, that they've got a lot of new elements. They kind of tighten some things up. So it's a, a lot different, but it's an expansion to Dune Imperium. And I think it would be really cool if we tested out the the two teams playing against each other yeah. at some point. Like that might be something yeah. to get into. And something to note too, it is a standalone expansion. So you don't need the base game or any of the previous expansions. You can just jump right into this one uh, right off the bat. That's a good point. The previous two expansions were augmentations to the base game, but this one is a standalone expansion. I still think it'll be really cool to mix and match all the pieces we've got because once we acquire this one, we will have all of those infinity stones together. <laughs> and need to do more in-depth strategy discussions because oh, yeah, there's yeah. so much more that's been it's added to the game since we looked at this. Breed future videos. So. Yeah. All right, Corey, take us home. Yeah, so perfect segue into my pick. Uh, I didn't really want to go with with the common tropes that I usually go with, like my top five games of all time are all like heavy strategy <laughs> games and that sort of thing, but it is a perfect segue in the sense that I'm gonna choose Lost Ruins of Arnak for yeah. this. We're actually getting this game to the table today. Mm -hmm. I just think it needs to receive some more love. Like we said uh, just a second ago, we love Dune Imperium, and Lost Ruins of Arnak is pretty much the Indiana Jones 
themed flavor version of Dune Imperium, mm -hmm. where you've got deck building mixed with worker placement, and the cards kind of dictate where your workers can go on the board. But in Lost Runes of Arnak, you are going out and collecting resources, trying to uh, submit those resources to the research track to get up uh, higher on that track for victory points. You're also trying to navigate to different locations, to navigate different temples, and the different temples then open up new worker placement spots. So the game is very mm -hmm. variable. Other players can now use that worker placement spot because you found it, so they are going to pretty much reap uh, off of your reward or off of what you had found. But what's also cool in this game and adds to the theme also is that when you do find a new temple or a new location, there's a big guardian monster that is guarding that location. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and use that spot freely to, to use that new worker placement spot even without defeating the Guardian, but when you come back to camp at night, you are adding a Fear card to your deck, which is a card that's just a complete toss-away throwaway card, mm -hmm. worth negative point at the end of the game, uh, that you do want to try to cull from your deck eventually, but you can al also defeat the Guardian for points and for a one-time special ability use as well. So there is a lot going on in this game, but also not too complex to where uh, it's not like the most complex of, for complexity's sake out there. It's definitely an approachable game, but still for more of the gamer gamer, side of things as well. So that is the Lost Ruins of Arnak. Awesome. So we gave you a dozen, at least a dozen, board games to be getting for a wide range of gamers or non-gamers this holiday season. From all of us here at Talking Cardboard, we wish you a happy holidays and let's get some games to the table. Guys, what are we still doing here? John, what's up? Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know about our big Extra Life event that's coming up at the very end of the year. We're just squeaking it in for 2023, but on December 30th, we're going to do our Extra Life board game marathon. Uh, starting probably early that morning, going to at least midnight. We won't make the whole 24 hours like a lot of people do, but we're old. Um, <laughs> so, and have kids. So not a lot we can do about that, but we're gonna try our best. Uh, basically, the Extra Life fundraiser is an effort to raise money for local children's hospitals. So all our money that we raise will be going to the Children's Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. We've done this, what, for four years now or something like yeah. that? We might have missed last year. Uh, but very fun for us. Uh, gets a lot of engagement and, again, raises money for a good cause. We love doing marathons and raising money for charity, Minnesota Children's Hospital. And Corey, what are some of your highlights, the things that you're looking forward to for Extra Life? Yeah, I look forward to this day every year. It's one of my favorite days of the year, just getting everybody together. We have a large group of people that, that join us for the games as well. We have a couple cameras uh, on the main table all day, all day long for that event as well. So definitely tune in to some live streaming events. I think we'll be live streaming it on YouTube and on Twitch. So tune in for either one of those to watch some of our shenanigan, shenanigans and games that we'll be playing. And I just, yeah, I have a blast every time. I love seeing the little uh, ticker symbol on the screen go up as we raise uh, more and more dollars for the event. I think we've at least, at least hit $1,000 uh, if not more every single year that we've yeah. done it and that goes like we said straight to the children's hospital Which is for a great great cause so a lot of fun uh, all around Yeah, and I think some of the the best moments that I've had are the games that I didn't think would be hits Like no, thanks that first time when that came to the table or when we usually end the night with like resistance or yeah. stuff like that or uh, Just different games that you end up pulling out of the woodwork yeah. that you have always wanted to play and there hasn't been an opportunity But we've got two game tables worth of people so one table is going to try out this game and then another is going to be doing something else. I really like when you are able to pull out deep from your collection the games you want to try and then we were able to play them and raise a bunch of money. Yeah, and other people too pulling deep from their collection that uh, you can only play with like 10 players. Right, with yeah. games like Captain Summer, oh, yeah, Captain Summer. Yeah. Done some really unique experiences at this table and you know, you know, all donations are welcome, but if you can definitely stop by the day of and give us a donation live, like it just adds to the excitement and we can give you a personalized thank you right then and there. Um, but we just like people to stop by, check things out and uh, support a great cause. So looking forward to seeing everyone December 30th, probably eight or 9 a.m. Central time mm -hmm. uh, is when we'll kick things off. And like I said, we'll go as long as we can until <laughs> at least midnight. Yeah, but, yeah it'll uh, be great. From all of us at Talking Cardboard, thank you.